It's indeed time for The World This Week, seven days for Paris Space Correspondents, one hour. The World This Week in partnership with the International Herald Tribune. And uh, with us this week, Ana Navarro Pedro of Portugal's leading weekly news magazine, Visao. Welcome. Also with us, Judah Grunstein, the man to blame for all you can find at worldpoliticsreview.com. Uh, Anthony Belanger of Franco-German public television station Arte, whose show is called... Le, the, the Blogger. The, the Blogger. blogger. Okay. Every week on Saturday at 12.30. All right. And, and you can catch it in French or German. Yes. And uh, also with this France 24 uh, Internet uh, Department guru uh, slash... Uh, uh, what do I say? What do you... What, what, you, you have so many... Uh, uh, <laughs> So many strings to you. That's right. <laughs> Lila Jacinto is with us. Uh, by the way, uh, you can follow Lila and uh, the show on Twitter at Francois F24 happens to be our handle. And you can also join the argument, but please keep it civil on the World This Week Facebook page, where earlier we asked you who you thought deserves uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, our good friend Monsef from uh, the Washington, D.C. area wrote, our Tunisian blogger, who else? Well, the, thought, the folks over in Oslo thought otherwise this year, but they did keep the Arab Spring in focus with a first ever Nobel Prize to a Yemeni. A few months ago, Tawakul Karman was a relatively unknown a journalist, activist, member of an Islamist party. Her politics have since changed, and this 32-year-old mother of three has become the most prominent figure of her nation's uprising in a single day. I am so happy for this award. It's, you know, this award for all Arab world, for all, all the people who, who dream on the freedom, who dream on dignity, on, you know, on their rights. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a award for you many people who are, you know, who are in this, who are sleep in the, in the streets since eight months. Youth, women, children. So uh, I am so happy. It's not for me. Tawakul Karman, um, sometimes controversial figure at home, but Judah Grunstein, we were saying before we went on air, it's instant worldwide fame. It is, and uh, and I mean, for me, for instance, I'm, I'm familiar with Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, but uh, I'm not at all familiar with these other two women. And, uh, and I think that that's actually a better use of the prize in the sense that it, it really attracts the world's attention to causes that we're not already, or that that I'm not already familiar with and that I imagine that other people too. Um, and I guess what I'm also struck with by what she was saying there uh, is is the way in which, um, especially this year, these, these women have been working and struggling and fighting for so long. And that this isn't uh, just one peace accord that was signed, but it's a, it's a prize that recognizes a life, a life of, of struggle that in many ways has been carried out and been going on Un, un, with the world unaware of it and outside of the, the global spotlight. So I think it's great that it, that it does shine the spotlight it, on, on that. On top of it, it's also extremely, these are areas of the world where it's extremely difficult for women mm -hmm. to, you know, really come forward and fight and being activists. And, and dangerous and, too. Yes. So that spotlight on them is... Let me just tell you, what it is the, I think it's the first Nobel Prize for a woman, Nobel, of course, of peace, huh, for more than Let's say, yes, since two, 2004, I don't know if you remember, mm -hmm. remember it was the, the Nobel Kenya. Prize for Mrs. Wangari Matai. And two, Kenya. Kenya. Kenyan away woman, week. exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, so it was a long time without a, a, a woman elected or selected yeah. uh, for a woman. And in her case, well, very interesting, you know, uh, uh, President Saleh has just come back to Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, last week we had uh, Abdul Awlaki, the Al-Qaeda, exactly. uh, right. uh, killed. You know, so Saleh has always pitched himself as, you know, a partner in the war on terror, you know, no doubt with Aulaki going, probably Washington was reconsidering, you know, the options of not having Saleh in, in Yemen, uh, could there be civil war, etc. So, I mean, this is a, a tremendous boost for the Yemeni, demo, you know, the democracy Africa, movement. let's say first, because they, on, on, on three, three Nobel Prize, because they distributed something like three Nobel Prize, two were to, uh, uh, Liberia. Went to, to, to Liberia and to Africa for women. Mm -hmm. The second thing, and, and also I'm quite touched by the fact that Mrs. Sirleaf 
Johnson Sirleaf uh, received that prize because mm -hmm. first she, she was the first elected, democratically elected president, uh, female president of the African continent. And above all, what is important is that I don't know if you remember, but before his, um, uh, uh, her term as president, everybody spoke about Liber Liberia, which was one of the most messy and the most slaughtered and the most murderer, with, with, a, with a history of murderer and, uh, uh, under Charles Taylor's okay. rule. And for more than four years now, nobody speaks anymore of Liberia Liberia, which is a good news. It mm -hmm. means that everything's <laughs> okay true. with the country. She's just running the country the, 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 the way that the politician has to run a country in peaceful terms and just giving back the country to the, Liber the Liberians. I mean, and this is the best thing for her presidential campaign. I was going <laughs> to say, yeah. yes, because she was, she's, Ellen Johnson she's running Sirleaf for the start of the Civil War supported Charles Taylor financially. In 2009, she apologized for that. Yes. She, however, um, uh, gets this endorsement uh, four days before the first round uh, uh, of the election. And that and and after she hit. promised not to run for re-election, which, you know, I mean, it's fine. It's not un unconstitutional mm -hmm. for, her to, for her to run again. But, you know, her, 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 her opponent is not at all happy with this and has come out with a statement mm -hmm. saying that. There, um, mm -hmm. There's another thing, too, because we're actually going to be running a briefing on this on Monday. Um, and part of the campaign has been this idea that, uh, that Sir Leaf is more a president for the international community than a than president for, for Liberia. Like, like, so this could play very well for her, but it could also backfire and be used as ammunition saying, look, she, she, this is who's electing her. Mm, right. uh, she's, she's good for the international community, but not necessarily And especially well, since the other woman, Lema Bowie, mm -hmm. uh, she was part of her campaign team in the previous election. She actually um, rallied the but women vote for her. The bare, truth, the bare truth about Liberia is that what is, good for, uh, what is good for Liberia is good for, I mean, the international community is holding the country, I mean, helping the country for more than four years now. M the, um, um, Many of the money which is invested there is invested by the international community. So what I mean is that uh, a good president for the international community is a good president for Liberia also. So it may be a good bet to, to elect Mrs. Sirleaf once again. All right, uh, Lema Bowie, let's, let's talk about mm -hmm. her a moment. Here's another uh, 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 mother who um, has uh, been uh, called a warrior for peace. She uh, at one point initiated a sex strike to, uh, against the war. Um, and she's somebody who's been quite outspoken. Um, she's still shy for her 40th birthday, quite outspoken when it comes to, to women's rights, perhaps the one of the three who's the focus the most on that issue. Uh, let's hear an excerpt from a speech in 2009 where uh, she spoke out against the use of rape as an instrument of war. Rape is something that you can continue to do away with because no one will ever raise the issue. And for those um, women and other groups going through peace talks right now, I think it's about time that we step away from that lie that if you raise this issue, it's going to jeopardize the smoothness of the process. Anna, Anna Navarro Pedro, it's true that uh, it's an issue where it's, it's so hard it's to... It's so hard to talk about it in Africa. I mean, it's so hard to talk about it in everywhere. Europe and everywhere you have... And there was a French recent case that mm. just showed us how difficult it can be. Uh, but in Africa, it takes particular courage because it breaks a lot of um, taboos. And, um, you know, and I'm wondering if we are not uh, seeing the, the, the next presidential candidate <laughs> for Liberia, actually. She looks like a woman of courage and of uh, character. All right. The, uh, the issue of uh, how uh, it all unfolds in sub-Saharan Africa and in the Arab Spring continues. And it, the, this week, the focus was a lot on Syria again, yeah. where the UN... Um, uh, was uh, in the eye of the storm. Now, the United Nations, you'll recall, approved a resolution that effectively opened the door to outside intervention in Libya. Supporters hailing that decision as a victory over the bad old days when a U.S.-led coalition bypassed the world body to invade Iraq. So, was Libya now a brief parenthesis? It could seem that way after what was the fifth draft of a resolution on Syria that no longer even included the word sanctions was rejected. Inside Syria, where according to UN figures, the death toll since the start of the uprising in mid-March is fast approaching 3,000 killed, um, there's a bit of misgiving over that vote, as you can see. But Moscow's not blinking, saying it wants evolution, not revolution. Uh, to claim, as an colleague did, that uh, our veto 
uh, uh, was uh, against the Arab Spring. Well, it's a cute little phrase, but uh, not a very serious one, because uh, we, of course, do not see the Arab Spring as something which should lead uh, to civil war. And this is uh, uh, where, in our view, uh, things are going uh, in, uh, in Syria. And uh, that's why we did not want to be a part of a strategy uh, which, uh, for whatever reason, is, in our view, is leading in that direction. Now, this Friday, uh, Russia's president uh, again defended that. Uh, he said that uh, the proposed text would have allowed again to resort to weapons like in Libya. Effectively, this veto was all about Libya. It was about Libya. It was about the abuse of the of the mandate of the Libyan mandate by the the Western coalition or the expansion of it. Uh, but I think it was also about Syria to the extent that um, if you look uh, if you look at who is who gets hit when certain countries are slapped with sanctions, uh, the the people the, the 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 countries that are on the list often happen to be major customers for Russian weapons or uh, or energy deals. Um, so you have Iran, where where Russia lost a huge amount of money in terms of arms deals. Libya, the same thing happened. Syria happens to be a major customer of Ru Russian weapons. The 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 Russian. But its oil goes mostly to Western Europe. Well, the, the Syrian oil isn't isn't a huge factor because they're not a major producer. But they uh, the Russia also uses a, a Syrian port in the Mediterranean. So I think there was a, I think it had to do with Libya. I think Russia's perspective it also had to do with the fact that they're the ones who are in a sense in a sense suffering economically from the sanctions. Um, and I think that uh, uh, there are other other stories in terms of who voted what on on the Security Council. But from the Russian perspective, I think it had to do with that and the the, the unease they had with how the the, the West used the Libyan uh, resolution. A, a, a veto Europe. today, Anthony mm -hmm. Belanger, does that mean a veto forever? On 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 Syria, I think so. I think so. I think what I, what I think is that you're right when you're saying that the abuse of the UN mandate on Libya warned countries like very reticent countries like uh, like uh, China and Russia and Russia that don't really want to, to, to give that kind of mandate to the to the Western world and the second thing is that the very different things that it's all about Libya because Libya was an uh, isolated country and always was which is not the case of Syria at all Syria is a main uh, diplomatic partner for most of the region she, uh, Syria has the keys in many in many in many answers uh, as many answers in the region you know towards um, uh, Turkey towards uh, Iran towards um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say key to the answers I'd say yes. they have, and Israel also. they have they have the ability to obstruct and, exactly. to, and to inflict pain which is a lot more of than power. more than solve Problems. Which it's is a, lot a totally of power different region. geopolitical game uh, in that area. So, and it's not only about Russia; it's also about China, mm -hmm. and uh, it's about uh, the emerging the BRICS, the emerging countries. Uh, a lot of them abstain. Yes, exactly. Defining a totally different geopolitical position in this 21st century, and you know, starting to stand by different positions from United States, Canada, and Europe. Right, how, do you, how do you explain, Lila Jacinto, that uh, Brazil, South Africa, and India abstained in that vote? Abstained from this, abstained from the Libya vote. In fact, the, the Indian ambassador to the UN very vocal about how displeased he was with, uh, with mm -hmm. the Libyan uh, vote. Uh, for me, it's interesting, you know, after these countries uh, have been crying about being on the Security Council, and then they sort of vote in a way that they haven't got over their colonial hang-ups. It's just like the West, so we cannot do it. You know, why would democracies I like? Think, I don't think. <laughs> so it's a non-aligned <laughs> movement kind of feeling. <laughs> Seems to me. I mean, and this is all. This is new. It's playing up right I, now. I, I, so I'm. I, I, I agree to the extent that it's hard to justify a, a seat on the Security Council with an abstention vote. Mm -hmm. If they had a position to take, vote for it or vote against it. But to abstain is the weakest of all solutions. I could see uh, it for, for Libya because they needed the votes. But you vote either you vote for or you vote against, especially if you're making the case that you deserve to be on I the council we, permanently. Just to, 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 to follow up on the, uh, on the, the issue of why did other countries, the BRICS, abstain, I think there is that we are actually watching the definition of a block uh, policy. And within that block, there are 
uh, different uh, opinions, different point of views, different interests. But we are seeing the emergence maybe of a uh, some common interest uh, in that uh, in that block of countries. Mm. That is interesting to watch because you know, they've been meeting for a long time. We haven't watched it, but they've been meeting for a long time. India, uh, China, Russia, for instance, meet very often uh, in you know in those well, three countries. Right. No, and so that's forth. Brazil is really coming forth. You no, know, really getting all of a sudden saying we are a giant and we're kind of clumsy, but they are coming forth as a giant and, you know, trying to put their um, their print. print. Mm. No, exactly, which is why I've been closely watching these well, countries sure, and it so seems yeah. to me what, you know, to see what's their, what's their focus, what's their message. For now, their message seems to be pretty much China. No. Leave countries to no. do their own thing. What, what is true also is that they're defending a completely different way to see the, 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 the outcome in the, in, in the, the region, in the world. They're defending their sovereignty. The idea that the nation is sovereign and nobody can interfere with it, which well, is one of the options. Why not? One I mean, question, though, Anthony yes. Belanger, on that point. Um, uh, the, there is another t nation that's mm. close to all these BRICS nations. Mm -hmm. It's Turkey. Mm -hmm. And Turkey is playing uh, a very different game. And Turkey is upping the tone. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this week, uh, the uh, prime minister saying um, he's going to press forth with sanctions. Yes, but you've got to imagine that, for example, a country like Brazil is on his own in his region. In its region, I mean, I mean, it's the biggest by far country, economy, or whatever in the region. It's exactly the same with Russia, with China, with with, with India. And they are worthy in themselves. It's, it's not the case of Turkey. Turkey is surrounded by by economies bigger than than its proper economy, and by problems which has to, which has to be shared with with the entire region. That's beginning by Greece, even Syria, even Iraq. So it's a different game because it's a different position, geopolitical and position. Turkey, Turkey, Turkey there is led also by a main war, the Kurds. And of course, you have the Syrian Kurds as well, joining up, uh, you know, with Kurds, the Iraqi honest, Kurds. Yes. And, you know, you know, it's Fisher a very old problem. One, of, one of their leaders, by the way, killed this Friday. Pardon? Yeah. Exactly. But so we, 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 Turkey is all their worries in that area. Main of all, are uh, dominated by the Kurd not problem. Only, not only that. Uh, Brazil, Brazil is also a country that has a very different look, you know, from um, about from for the West mm. and about the West interference in world affairs. Brazil had a dictatorship, never had any help from another country. Uh, we spoke uh, Port Brazil is, was a former Portuguese colony. They've seen, seen Portugal and Spain, Second World War. We are saving West is saving the world from. Third Reich from Nazism, Portugal and Spain are maybe dictatorships. Oh, so Brazil, Brazil, Brazil maybe in a different. They are dictatorships, but I mean, they are good dictatorships. So they, no one interferes with us. No one came to save us from a different, dictators. A different so story. Brazil, I mean, everybody in Brazil has studied public affairs in the world scene in a different way from mm. you know from the rest of the world. We're, mm. we're going to uh, pick up with uh, with our next topic when we come back, which is. Uh, looking at 10 years of war in Afghanistan, as well as a tribute to Steve Jobs when the world this week continues. <laughs> 